Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lucy Hutiera. I'm a professor in the Department of Earth and Environment, and it's a tremendous honor to have been invited here to make a few remarks about my dear friend and uh, colleague, Professor Anthony Genados. Tony had a tremendous impact on the students, faculty, and staff here at BU. He was a professor in the Department of Earth and Environment, was a director at the Pardee Center for six years, and he was an incredible human being. He had a keen intellect, a kind heart, and he proved himself to be a truly altruistic leader. He led the university in the development of our first climate action plan, which I had the privilege of helping with, and I learned a lot about how to lead and what, how determination could make the impossible possible. Today, we're on track to meet the what seemed like audaciously bold goals of that plan, and it was through Tony's leadership. Tony brought many amazing people to the university. He uh, invited Marsha McNutt, who was then the president of the National Academies of Science. He invited Thomas Lovejoy, who is truly a forefather in the environmental movement and worked to bring science into policy and decision making, especially with uncertainty. He also invited Robert Watson, who was a lead of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. And those three are really seminal figures that embody much of what is the spirit and the heart of the Pardee Center. So I think it is incredibly fitting and appropriate and just wonderful today to be able to acknowledge the contributions that Tony made through his time here at BU with the inaugural Anthony Genados Distinguished Lecture. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce the current director of the Pardee Center for the Longer Range Future, Ambassador Jorge Heine. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, students, friends. It is for me a very special pleasure uh, to stand before you uh, this afternoon and uh, to introduce to you uh, today's speaker, my good friend, Ambassador Kishore Mabuban, who has come especially from Singapore to share his insights into which way this troubled world is going. After a three-year hiatus imposed by the pandemic, the Pardee Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future is especially proud to be able to resume its annual Distinguished Lecture Series, now named after my predecessor, Professor Anthony Genetus, whose uh, contributions you have just heard from. And it is, of course, especially significant to be able to do so with such an illustrious visitor as the one we have today. It would not be an exaggeration to say that Ambassador Mabubani is widely considered to be one of Asia's leading thinkers, and one of its most prominent public intellectuals. He has established this reputation on the basis of an extraordinary career as a diplomat, as a scholar, and as an analyst. Educated in Singapore and in Canada, he joined the Singaporean Foreign Service reaching what some consider to be the pinnacle of an ambassadorial career that is that of permanent representative to the United Nations, a position he occupied twice for over 10 years. Upon retiring from the service, he became the founding dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore, his alma mater, a position he held for 13 years and where he is now a distinguished fellow at the Asia Research Institute. Yet, I would like to posit to you this afternoon that beyond his contributions to statecraft and to university administration, it is as an author that Ambassador Mabopani has made perhaps his most significant mark. You may have seen him on CNN 
on a GPS program on Sunday mornings with Farid Zakaria, a program that I always recommend to my students. Some of them apparently have better things to do on a Sunday morning, but it is a great program. It seems to be a flagship program on international affairs on CNN, and uh, Ambassador Mubadi is a frequent guest on it. You may have read his columns in the Financial Times, where he's a regular contributor, or his articles in foreign affairs and in foreign policy. But the reason he is in such heavy demand from the world's top media outlet is because of the high quality and the wide readership of his books. In the past 20 years, he has published nine of them, and he is now at work on his memoirs, uh, which are awaited with keen interest. In these books, topics like the Asian way of thinking, the emergence of ASEAN, the rise of China, and the notion of the Asian century, which he has put forth with great verb, have all been dissected with remarkable brio by his vigorous prose. Some of his books have raised eyebrows, among other things, because of the very catchy titles he has. And let me welcome Governor Weld, who joins us this afternoon, a good friend of Ambassador Mabubani. Um, the favorite uh, title of them, it seems to me, and that has, again, raised many eyebrows is, of course, has China won? Question mark. And, um, you know, in our academic circles, we are happy when a book of us sells a couple of thousand copies, and that is considered a great achievement. Well, Ambassador Mwani moves in different circles. His most recent book, The Asian 21st Century, published by Springer, that again, I recommend to my students, can be downloaded freely from the web and has in fact been downloaded 2.7 million times at this point. Now, there's a book with a wide readership for you. As someone who's been an ambassador both to India and to China, and has seen firsthand the enormous dynamism and energy of the two so-called Asian giants, I must say I can fully relate to the notion that we are moving towards the Asian century. But will it happen? Will we get there? And if so, what are its implications for the rest of the world? Without further ado, I live with you, Ambassador Kishor Mabuani. Professor Ambassador Hoe Heine, Governor William Weld, <laughs> my good friend Bill, friends. Um, I'm afraid Jorge has done me a big disfavor. He has raised your expectations so high. <laughs> so please lower them <laughs> uh, if you can. But I want to say that it's truly a great honor to be invited here to deliver the Janethos uh, lecture. And I, I never met him, but I, I can see that he had a very illustrious career and made a huge uh, difference. And I hope that my uh, lecture will help to in some one way or another contribute to his legacy. Now, as you know, I've chosen as a title, uh, is the Asian century really coming? Let me give you the answer. Yes. <laughs> I can sit down now <laughs> and give the shortest <laughs> Janitor's lecture, one word lecture. But I presume you came here expecting more than a one word lecture. But I also want to emphasize at the very beginning that there is tremendous resistance to the idea that an Asian century is coming and a tremendous amount of disbelief. And I, would, I think it's a fair comment to say among many Western intellectual circles. So I hope today my contribution is to, at the end of the day, convince you that it is real and it is coming. And I'll, what I'll try to do is divide my remarks into three parts. In part one, I'll explain why the Asian century is an absolute certainty. In part two, I'll also 
discuss the many challenges that Asian countries will face even as they march into the Asian century. And then thirdly, I'll discuss how the Asian countries will try to find innovative solutions to the problems that they're facing. And I'll try to do that in the 40 minutes you assigned to me. But I want to begin at the same time my lecture by making uh, a very important clarification. If you're looking for the Asian century and assume you can find it as easily as the American century or the uh, European century, you will you'll have lots of difficulties. And to explain why, let me use the metaphor of flowers. Now we could easily see the great European Renaissance because the blossoming of European civilizations was like the blossoming of one flower. Let's call it the rose. Yes, there are different types of roses, there are different colors, but a rose is a rose. And as Shakespeare said, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. By contrast, when you, when you see the forthcoming blossoming of Asian civilizations, you won't see the blossoming of one flower. You will see many different flowers uh, blossom. Indeed, Asian civilizations are as different from each other uh, as they are from the great European civilization. For example, the major Asian civilizations, the Chinese civilization, the Indic civilization, the Islamic civilization, are different from one another. So how does the success of one translate the success of another civilization? And if Asia is so diverse, why speak of Asia? Why not speak of different Asian civilizations? And my answer is that despite the significant differences among the Asian civilizations, there are deeper organic links between them despite the differences. And these deeper organic links, I must emphasize, have been forged over thousands of years. And to illustrate, to give you an illustration of these organic links, I'm going to uh, tell you in a sense, a personal story, how I as one individual Asian have cultural links with the two ends of Asia, from Tehran to Tokyo. Now, I can say this, and I'll describe my, my, my background. I was born to two Hindu Sindhi parents in Singapore in the same year as Jorge in 1948. As a result, I can feel a cultural connection with over 1 billion Hindus in South Asia. At the same time, if you travel to Southeast Asia, right, which is some distance from India, out of the, out of the 10 Southeast Asian states, nine have an Indic cultural base, 550 million people. And then my parents left Pakistan in 1947 because, as you know, of the painful partition between Hindu India and Islamic Pakistan. But as a child, when I learned to read and write Sindhi, the script of Sindhi is not like the script in which you use for Hindi. The script of Sindhi is like the Arabic script. And my name, Mabubani, comes from a Persian Arab word, Mabub, which means beloved. So when I go to Tehran, I can feel the connections there. At the same time, if I go to the other end, if I go to Tokyo, or if I go to China, Korea, and Japan, I can also feel some cultural affinity because of Buddhism. Buddhism, as you know, came from India. And when I was young, my mother would take me to pray in Hindu temples and Buddhist temples. So you can see, I, as one individual, have in one way or another, cultural links with all corners of Asia. But I'm not the first Asian to feel this. One of the greatest statesmen that Asia has produced in the 20th century was Jawaharlal Nehru, the founding prime minister of India. He lived from 1889 to 1964. 
most of his life was spent under British colonial rule. And as you know, British colonial rule was very effective because the British mentally colonized the Indians and made them believe that they were an inferior race. So they accepted British colonial rule. So when did they begin to believe that they could be liberated from British colonial rule? Well, Jawaharlal Nehru says that the Japanese victory over Russia in 1904-1905, I quote his words, was a great pick-me-up for Asia. In India, it lessened the feeling of inferiority from which most of us suffered, unquote. As you know, India is not close to Japan. Indeed, New Delhi is 5,800 kilometers from Tokyo. Yet the Japanese victory over Russia, European power, created a surge of enormous pride among Indians. But Indians were not the only Asian country to feel the pride after the Japanese defeated the Russians. Many other Asian leaders felt inspired by this Japanese victory including Chinese nationalist Sun Yat-sen, pan-Islamic intellectual Abdurashad Ibrahim, Burmese nationalist icon Wu Otama, and later Mao Zedong, who was a schoolboy then. And as, a, and one of, as one of the best writers of our time, Pankaj Mishra wrote, and I quote, they all drew the same lesson from Japan's victory. White men, conquerors of the world, were no longer invincible, a hundred fantasies of national freedom, racial, racial dignity, or simple vengefulness now bloomed in hearts and minds that had suddenly endured <clears throat> European authority over their lands. And I want to add here that it wasn't only the Japanese military victory over Russia that inspired the Asians, the Japanese success in creating an industrial miracle after the Meiji Restoration also inspired other Asians. And the, and the architect, for example, of Singapore's economic miracle was Dr. Go King Sui, and he would tell me that he would always study what the Japanese did after the Meiji Restoration. The reason I tell you all this is to emphasize to you that there are deeper connections among Asia, and there is and Asian soul, and many different parts of Asia feel this connectivity with each other. And the reason why you don't see more of it is that 200 years of Western colonial rule cut off the natural links between different parts of Asia. And it takes time to repair them. For example, within India and Southeast Asia, which flourished trading each other for over 2000 years, the cut, their links were cut, but they'll come back. So you can see therefore, Asia is real. And that's why there is a kind of Asian white Renaissance taking place and is being driven by three structural forces. The first structural force I have to emphasize is that that's driving the growth of Asia is that it is a return to normality. Now, the most important fact to know about Asian history is that the two largest economies of the world from the year one to the year 1820 for 1800 out of the last 2000 years were always those of China and India. So this means very clearly that the last 200 years of Western domination of history have been an aberration. So what you are seeing therefore in the 21st century is just a natural return to the norm. And I can tell you that future historians will be surprised by the speed of return of China and even India. I mean, for example, in the year 2000, the US economy in nominal market terms was $10 trillion, eight times larger than China, which was $1.2 trillion. But by 2022, the US economy 
instead of being 10 times, uh, eight times larger, was only 1.3 times larger in 20 years. In the case of India, the same is true. Uh, the, comparing it with the United Kingdom, UK's GNP was 3.5 times larger than India, but last year India's GDP became bigger than the United Kingdom. And this speed will continue. And the second structural reason why this Asian century will happen is that the key Asian states, and in some ways, this is probably the most important point you should absorb, have, after years of struggling, years of struggling, they had independence 50, 60 years ago. They struggled for 50, 60 years. But finally, they have become functionally competent states, implementing a slew of rational policies in many different areas of governance. It took time to achieve this, and they stumbled along the way. But it has been achieved, and in short, the Asian societies have finally figured out how to succeed in terms of economic growth. And incidentally, if you look at the Wikipedia entry for the Asian century, and the Wikipedia uh, entry has a paragraph describing what is driving the return of Asia, they say that among many scholars that have provided factors that have contributed to significant Asian development, Kishore Mahbubani provides seven pillars uh, that have contributed to the Asian country's uh, success. They've left out a critical phrase, by the way. In my book, I say these are the seven pillars of Western wisdom. The Asian countries have finally absorbed Western wisdom and figured out how to succeed. And these seven pillars are things like free market economics, science and technology, meritocracy, pragmatism, culture, peace, rule of law, education. But all are important, but I would say the three that stand out are firstly science and technology. And as you know, the way the West was able to conquer and colonize the world was through mastery of science and technology. And there's no doubt that the West remains ahead uh, uh, of Asia and the rest of the world in science and technology. Just look at what's happening in Boston every day, and you can see how far ahead the West is to this. Yet, even the conservative Australian Strategic Policy Institute has documented that in about 44 areas of critical technology, China is ahead in 37, the US is ahead in seven. That's quite a change. In terms of the number of citations or papers in tier one scientific journals, China is now number one. Uh, the US produced 34,000 PhD graduates in STEM subjects, China produced 50,000. So all the indicators are there of a powerful return. And the second pillar, of course, is free market economics. And here something very strange is happening. As you know, the principles of free market economics were taught by the West to Asia. Yet the Asian countries are implementing them better. Let me give you a concrete example. In 2018, when President Donald Trump imposed tariffs on Chinese imports to the US, uh, Economics 101 would tell us that these tariffs wouldn't hurt the Chinese, they would hurt American consumers and American workers. And indeed, during his campaign trail, President Joe Biden said in 2019, and I quote, President Trump may think he's being tough on China. All that he's delivered as a consequence of that is American farmers, manufacturers, and consumers are losing and paying more, unquote. President Joe Biden said this in 2019. We're now in 2023. Four years have passed. President Joe Biden hasn't removed the tariffs that have hurt American workers, consumers, and farmers. 
And this, this I can tell you, by the way, and I'll come discuss this a bit more, is really puzzling to the rest of the world. How is it that the West taught us economics 101 and we are now implementing it and you are not? Now, this brings me to the third structural reason why, why the Asian resurgence will continue. And the simple point here is that the Asian societies have generated what I call virtuous cycles of peace and development. In short, they have put in place policies that will facilitate and accelerate Asian development. And I must emphasize to you that this has come as a surprise to many uh, Western scholars, because when the Cold War ended around 33 years ago in 1990, Western scholars said that U Europe would remain peaceful and Asia would go to war. Aaron Friedberg of Princeton University, for example, said, and I quote, while civil wars and ethnic strife will continue for some time to smolder along Europe's peripheries, in the long run, it is Asia that seems far more likely to be the cockpit of great power conflict. The half millennium during which Europe was the world's primary generator of war, as well as wealth and knowledge is coming to a close, but for better and for worse, Europe's past could be Asia's future, unquote, 1990. Europe was supposed to remain peaceful. Asia was supposed to be at war. And what is stunning is that there have been no major wars in Asia since the Cold War ended. And all the major wars have been on the periphery of Europe. That's quite surprising. Just this one fact should make you aware that maybe something is going right in Asia. But at the same time, to be honest, we also face real challenges in Asia, real challenges. And here too, I'll speak about three major challenges. You see, I like the number three for some reason. The first challenge is gonna come from the geopolitical arena. And as Jorge has just mentioned, uh, I document in my book, Has China Won? We will see over the next 10 years an acceleration in the biggest geopolitical contest ever seen, in fact, indeed of all time, the US-China contest. Now, this is a massive subject. I know I wrote an entire book about it. But since I wrote it and published it in 2020, I become even more convinced that the, the US-China contest will accelerate over the next 10 years. As you know, it's very dangerous uh, to make predictions about the future. A lot, a lot of time predictions are falsified, but I'm prepared to take a bet with any of you that the US-China contest will accelerate. And it will do so because there's now a rock solid consensus in the Washington DC establishment that the US must stop China's development before China becomes number one. By the way, this also explains why President Joe Biden has not been able to lift the tariffs, even though they're self-destructive. Because of the consensus, we just must hit up at China. This also explains why the US passed the CHIPS Act to deny China access to the most advanced chips and chip making technology. This is also explains why acts like the China Trade Relations Act have been introduced in the US Senate. All the signs are clear. The US-China contest will accelerate. So will, this, will these measures stop China's economic development? Well, I guess the honest answer is that time will tell whether they will stop China. But most countries in the world believe that China will succeed. Now, why, why do I say this with great confidence? Well, I say there's an old American expression, people vote with their feet. Now, that normally refers to the millions of migrants who are trying to, as you know, cross the world, and many of them want to come into the United States. They're voting with their feet. But if you look at a different cluster of people, at the leaders of the world, and you see how they're voting with their feet, they're voting with their feet by going to Beijing. 
And just in the past few weeks, four weeks, New Zealand Foreign Minister Victoria, uh, Nanya Mahamahuta, Victorian, Prim, uh, Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews, Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim, Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong, French President Emmanuel Macron, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, and then Brazilian President Lula Lula was also supposed, also supposed to be there. Just in the past four weeks. And you'll see that accelerate. Because the rest of the world understand that China today is unstoppable. And it also explains uh, that they, be they believe that in one way or another, you have to deal with a successful China. And if you look at the current issue in the magazine Foreign Affairs, there's an article by me uh, called Asia's Third Way, which explains how the Asian countries are adapting to the return of Asia. And, and the big danger that the United States faces today, and I think it's a real danger, is you know there is a consensus among many in the United States that the United States should try to decouple from China. By the same time, China's integration with the rest of the world, especially its integration with the rest of Asia, is becoming incredibly strong. So when the United States tries to decouple from China, it may inadvertently end up decoupling from the world that is coupled to China. This is not a problem the United States had with the Soviet Union. This is why the China challenge is much, much bigger than even what people think it is. Now, the second structural challenge that Asian countries will face is that they don't control many of the key institutions of global governance. And as you know, many of the key institutions of global governance were set up at a time when the West was very powerful, very dominant. And take, for example, uh, the IMF and the World Bank. Now, since their founding, uh, and they were founded in 1945, I believe, right? Uh, almost 80 years ago. There's been a rule that the head of the IMF should be a European and the head of the World Bank should be an American. Now you would assume that rule, that rule frankly made sense, okay, in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, but the world has changed, right? The most dynamic economies in the world are in Asia. They're not in Europe, right? So how is it? that the two most powerful institutions of international economic governance and Asian cannot run. So this is an example of resistance to change. Now, in theory, by the way, the voting shares of the IMF and World Bank are supposed to correlate with their shares of global GNP. How much, what percentage of vote you get in the IMF or the World Bank depends on your share of the global GNP. There's a theory. In practice, even though China's share of the global GDP is what, 17, 18% now, uh, its share of the vote in uh, IMF is 3.6%. That's resistance to change. And that makes it hard. And that this will therefore become part of the problem for Asian countries because they won't be able to influence key institutions. And the third big challenge to the emergence of an Asian century is the reluctance of the Asians themselves to acknowledge that an Asian century is on the way. I can assure you that Asians, as you know, by nature, tend to be more diffident. I am a, I can assure you, a deviant Asian. <laughs> I speak in a much bolder fashion than most Asians ever would. And Asians would, would and in Asian culture especially, I, I must emphasize, self-promotion is frowned upon. And in, you know, so in, in American society, I mean, we have Donald Trump or hogging the news or Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, or Robin Free, they are admired. They're marketing themselves. In Asian societies, if you promote yourself, people look down on you. 
And there's an old Japanese proverb that says, the heavier the head of rice, the deeper it bows. Therefore, you notice that no Japanese scholar ever wrote a book called Japan as number one. It took an American to write a book as Japan as number one to explain the success of Japan. So, I, and I believe that this cultural diffidence on the part of Asians, and this is true of a range of Asian societies, will have to also change. So all this brings me to the last part of my lecture and I'll finish in the time you allotted. Uh, what, how can the Asians, in one way or another, provide leadership to the world as they become stronger and more uh, economically more powerful and have a greater impact on the world. And I believe that they can provide leadership again in three areas. Uh, the first area that Asia will provide leadership to the world will be in the area of trade and economic integration. Now, as I emphasized earlier, all the theories and the benefits of trade and economic integration were developed and sold by the West to the rest of the world. The ideas came from Western scholars like Adam Smith and David Ricardo. And what, what's surprising is that even though the ideas originated in the West, the ideas have remained in the West, but the practices have moved uh, to the East. And here I want to emphasize uh, that in the past, it used to be the United States that used to be the chief advocate of free trade around the world. President Ronald Reagan, for example, said that our economic system based on individual freedom, private initiative and free trade has produced more human progress than any other in history. It's all is in all our interest to preserve it, protect it and strengthen it. The, Uni and he, the, the United States took the lead after World War II in, uh, in creating an international trading and financial system that limited government's ability to disrupt free trade across the borders. We did this because history had taught us an, an important lesson. Free trade serves the cause of economic progress and it serves the cause of world peace." Unquote. This is Ronald Reagan, right? Today, the US Congress cannot pass a single free trade bill, despite such clear statements, right? And, and, and it's actually quite shocking that it is the Asian countries that are implementing free trade principles. Now, here's one concrete example so you understand what, 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 what happens when you don't implement free trade. In the year 2000, US trade with the 10 ASEAN countries in ASEAN, in Southeast Asia, was $135 billion, right? And US trade was a result of US opening up itself up. And China's trade with ASEAN was only $40 billion. So US trade was more than three times China's trade with ASEAN. But by 2021, US trade with ASEAN had grown significantly, almost three times, from $135 to $380 billion, almost three times, but China's trade with ASEAN, because China had signed a free trade agreement with ASEAN in 2001, went from 40 billion. And last year, it hit 975 billion. An increase of 25 times in 20 years. I can tell you, this has never happened before. Never. You look at the trade between the two largest economic entities in the world. The United States and the European Union are the two largest economic entities in the world. They've had trading relationships for hundreds of years. What is the total trade? 900 billion. Less than China and ASEAN. So it's just, this is an example of amazing shifts that are happening all in the last 20 years. Amazing shifts. This is what makes the, the Asian century so real. Now let me add another shocking statistic. The combined uh, economies of the European Union in 2022 
was 16.6 trillion, over four times larger than ASEAN's combined GDP of 3.6 trillion. EU 16.6, ASEAN 3.6. Now let me ask you a simple question. Did the EU or the ASEAN contribute more to global economic growth between 2010 and 2020? The EU is so much bigger, four times bigger. No, it was ASEAN. It's quite amazing, <laughs> right? So this is, this is, this is uh, as a result of that, by the way, uh, the ASEAN countries have grown phenomenally. In the year 2000, Japan's GDP, and I, as you know, Japan is one of the most successful economies in Asia. Japan's GDP was, in the year 2000, eight times the size of ASEAN. Now it is 1.5 times the size of ASEAN. And by 2030, ASEAN will be bigger than Japan. Again, all this is happening in the last 20, 30 years. Remarkable shifts. And that's where I think, that's why I think that Asians will provide the leadership in trade and economic integration because they have seen the benefits. They know it works. And the world's largest free trade agreement, the RCEP, is, was launched last year. The second point, the second reason why I think, the second area in which Asia will lead the world is that the Asian countries are now going to integrate themselves not just among themselves, but with the rest of the world too. And uh, China joined the WTO only in 2001, five decades after the United States did. And in 2001, as I mentioned earlier, the US economy was eight times larger than that of China. But by 2013, China's trade with the world had become larger than that of the US. Indeed, by 20, 21, China's trade with the world of 6.1 trillion was 1.3 times larger than US trade of 4.7 trillion. And more critically, more than 120 countries now trade more with China than they do with the US. And this is true, by the way, for countries that are even very far away from uh, China. As you know, Brazil is much, much closer to the United States uh, than it is to uh, China. But in 2022, Brazil's trade with China of $150 billion was larger than US trade with Brazil of $92.6 billion. And again, it's grown very fast. In the year 2000, it took the Brazil one year to export $1 billion to China. Now it takes Brazil 72 hours to export $1 billion to China. See the speed of change. And it's not just within Asia, the rest of the world is, is also getting uh, integrating. And just let me add another statistic to illustrate what are the structural forces that are also driving this. And this is an uh, uh, important point because everybody assumes that the biggest markets are still in the West. But in 2010, the size of the retail goods market in the US was $4 trillion more than double the size of the Chinese retail goods market, which was $1.8 trillion, 2010. By 2020, US had grown from 4 trillion to 5.5 trillion, 4 to 5.5. China's had grown from 1.8 to 6 trillion, bigger than the US. And I want to add another important point here, that the size of the middle-class population in Asia is also exploding. And I'm going to focus on the three major economic entities, what I call the new CIA. Now, CIA is not Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, CIA is China, India, ASEAN. 1.4 billion in China, 1.4 billion in India, close to 700 million in ASEAN, that makes it 3.5 billion, I guess over 40% of the world's population, right? Among these 3.5 billion people, in the year 2000, there were only 150 million people in the middle class. Only 150 million, right? By 2020, the number was bigger than 2 billion. 
and by 2030, you'll reach 3 billion. So when you have this exploding middle-class populations, these markets will attract the whole world because that's where the growth is going to come from, from this massive, large, new middle-class populations. Now, finally, the, the final area in which Asia might provide some leadership to the world is through sharing, beginning to share its rich cultural output from its ancient histories. And it's fair to say the total output of many of these ancient civilizations, wherever you go, India, China, Southeast Asia, is massive, right? But you only begin to share, you only begin to have a cultural renaissance only after you have an economic resurgence. So what you've seen so far in Asia is the economic resurgence. I hope I've given you enough data to convince you it's happening. And that will now be followed by cultural renaissance, and that's just beginning. And the rest of the world is beginning uh, to be uh, aware of it. And as you know, cultural products, for example, from South Korea, have now stormed the world. Uh, I must confess, I've never watched BTS. I suspect you all have. Uh, I can't do the Gangnam dance, but you know, it's amazing how one country like South Korea has exported so much. But in, in the, uh, even Japan uh, last year, the global demand for Japanese anime grew by 118% over the course of the pandemic. And more than uh, 100 million households watch anime on Netflix from 2019 to 2020. And of course, there's Bollywood from India and so on and so forth. And the global yoga market is expected to reach $66 billion. So you can see that while Asia has focused a lot on its economic development over the last 20, 30 years, you will now see a great cultural resurgence and that will attract the rest of the world to Asia too. So in short, to summarize my lecture in a few words, the center of gravity of the world's economy will shift to Asia, especially to East Asia. This shift is unstoppable. And this economic resurgence will in turn generate the renaissance of several different Asian civilizations in short, as I said at the beginning of my lecture, when Asian societies return to the center stage of world history, you will see a thousand flowers bloom. Thank you. And now, well, uh, the floor is open. I have many questions of my own, but I will uh, refrain from asking him, let me also welcome our Dean, uh, Dr. Scott Taylor, who is joining us sitting next to Governor Well. And um, the floor is open. Question, please identify yourself when you have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for the good lecture. Um, I'm Dr. Mangesh, I'm from uh, South Asia Institute of Technology. Uh, just have a quick question. I think you've made an excellent guess about the economic center changing. I think there's really no argument there. But I was wondering if you could talk a bit more on the political side of it, because economic center, of course, for the last 18, you know, for the first 1800 years, as you mentioned, was Asia, hmm. but didn't always translate into political capital. Uh, how do you think that's happening, especially since, you know, a lot of British commentators do say that the US would use anything to at least exploit the India-China divide or war. Hmm. So how would that create, you know, hmm. uh, how would that then transform economic capital into Britain. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really, is it on the microphone? Yes, yes, it's on. Awesome. Uh, I'm really glad you asked that question because I didn't have time to, you know, there, there are various layers of complexity. And uh, in my book, Has China Won? I do point out that the US-China contest will not just be purely between the US and China. Uh, the US will certainly try to get other states uh, to go along with it, whether it's the European states or within Asia, uh, as you know, United States has set up the Quad, 
and the Quad is United States, India, Japan, Australia. And it's not a secret that for very different reasons, uh, India, uh, Japan, and Australia are very troubled by China. Uh, and so it's possible that you could have some countries in Asia aligning with the United States against uh, China. That's a, that's a possibility. Uh, but at the same time, I think each of these three states will not give up all their ties with China. I mean, for Australia, its number one market is still China. It exports far more to China than it does to uh, United States. And Japan, uh, as you know, Ezra Vogel of Harvard wrote a book on Japan and China. And he says that Japan and China have the longest continuous recorded history uh, of any two countries in the world. Very detailed records, 1500 years plus. And he says that out of this 1500 years, uh, maybe 1450 was at peace, but they had 50 years of war. Unfortunately, the 50 years of war were quite recent from 1895 to 1945. But over time, uh, it's also possible for Japan and China to overcome the traumas of the 20th century and go back to a pattern, which is the pre-20th pre century, where they used to live in peace with each other. Uh, the most complicated relationship is the one within China and India, because there are many, there are many, many dimensions to it. Uh, I think you all know that relations within China and India became bad uh, after there was a skirmish at the border in June 2020 and uh, several Indian and Chinese soldiers died in the skirmish and since then relations have gone uh, downwards. Uh, they haven't stabilized yet, uh, but you notice that India is also very careful about not identifying itself as an ally uh, of the United States. And indeed, uh, you notice that the Quad, uh, even though everyone sees it, as an anti-China coalition, when the Quad countries meet, the word China never appears, ever, in any of their communiques. So I think there's some degree of uh, sensitivity down there. So the, the story, therefore, within Asia, there'll be many geopolitical shifts taking place, and there'll be adjustments taking place. But if it is possible, you can have all significant adjustments without going to war with one another. Yes, um, I'm Anas, an undergrad in the party school, and recently we saw the CEO of TikTok being questioned in the Congress. And um, I'm wondering what the political implications of this questioning is, and if this is a political gest gesture uh, on behalf of the United States, and if China will, um, what's the word, uh, would respond, how would China respond to this political gesture? Mm. So, well, I mean, the, I mean, there's no doubt that the United States suspicion of TikTok uh, is related to the US-China contest, for sure. And the fact that the uh, ultimate owner of TikTok as a Chinese company is, is a, is a um, uh, reason for this concern. But I think I would recommend to you, uh, Jorge mentioned the program of Farid Zakaria. Uh, Farid Zakaria wrote a brilliant column on TikTok. <laughs> uh, have a look at it. It's in the Washington Post. And I agree with everything that Farid said in the column. And he said that the United States actually believe that there should be freedom of ideas, right? And let TikTok compete in the marketplace of ideas. Now, the, the concern is that the data of TikTok will be taken by the Chinese government. So even an assurance, the Singaporean CEO is that all the data collected in the United States will remain in the United States in servers that are controlled by American companies. So to, to I mean, that, that, I think that's a concern, it's legitimate. So the TikTok is saying, okay, I assure you, I guarantee you that you can monitor this. All, only Americans will monitor this to ensure that the uh, data stays there. But so if, if, if the decision was made on rational grounds, uh, I think the problem would be, could be solved, but there is a lot of emotion in the US-China contest. So I'm afraid that TikTok will continue to face significant pressures. Governor Will. The microphone coming. The mic, mic is there. 
Thank you. Kishore, as you know, I'm in your camp on this and have been for some time. Kishore and I are old friends and friends with Kishore and his bride and his children, whom we call the Mabu babies. <laughs> but uh, before Xi Jinping took office, he was not even in office. And he yeah. said, made a public statement referring to the United States, saying, we have a thousand reasons to be friends. Now, I found that electrifying. It's mm. evoking the, the thousand flowers. And mm. I, I think my question is, why do Americans, particularly in Washington, have such a difficult time understanding that? And there's a number of possible explanations, all bad. Uh, one is that when they say we want fair trade, they want we win trade. Uh, and, and it goes from bad to worse on that. And as you know, I've uh, had a couple of runs at national office to try to rationalize that mm -hmm. sort of uh, thinking uh, on the part of uh, politicians in Washington. And I, I just, um, I, I pray your judgment as to why it's not one man, it's not Donald Trump. The whole country has uh, gotten befogged on this uh, on this issue. But if you have any uh, thoughts on that, that's my question. Uh, well, I mean, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, the consensus against China is not restricted to a few uh, top leaders in the United States. Uh, there is now a deep societal distrust within the United States uh, of China. It's very deep. And so uh, even though uh, the American society is very badly divided between the Republicans and Democrats, who, as you know, don't agree on anything, but they only agree on one thing, on China. It's time to stand up to China. Uh, and so for now, I anticipate that the anti-China sentiment in the US will keep on rising. But it'll keep on rising until hopefully at some point in time, somebody will ask a simple question. Uh, are we winning or losing uh, the battle for the hearts and minds of the rest of the world in this battle against China? So as you know, in the Cold War, the great strength of the United States was that the United States had far more powerful allies, like in Europe and in Asia and South Korea, even Indonesia, Pakistan, Egypt, and so on and so forth. But today, uh, if you look at the 193 countries in the world, and you ask yourself how many of the 193 countries in the world want to enthusiastically join the United States in stopping the rise of China, I think you may be able to count them on your fingers, less than 10 at the most. And But most of the uh, significant countries in the world clearly want to have good ties with United States, but they also want to have good ties uh, with China. And even all your, your, even your key allies I mean, take Saudi Arabia, for example, right? Saudi Arabia was always much, much closer to the United States than it ever was to China. But Saudis are clearly saying, we will not take sides. We'll be friends with the US, we'll be friends uh, with China. And if you listen very carefully to what Macron said uh, after leaving China, uh, he made it very clear. He says that it is not in Europe's interests to decouple from China. So the signals that you're getting from many of your close friends will be, can you please calm down in this contest against China and try to find ways and means of living and working with each other in a way that doesn't uh, break up the rest uh, of the world. Because, and I also believe that if, you know, the Boston is known as the I guess the Athens of America. North America. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and if you believe that people here believe in sound and logical, rational reasoning before you make policies, if you do a rational cost benefit analysis of current American policies on China, the costs are very clear, the benefits are not. Because at the end of the day, if you think you can stop China, fine, go ahead. 
But as I said in my remarks, most countries in the world believe that you cannot stop China. And you've got to live with a new, strong, more power. It'd be uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, a big China is going to be uncomfortable, of course. You know, when you have a new elephant walking in the room, it, it, it squeezes the space for everybody else. Of course, it's uncomfortable. But you've got to live with that elephant. And, and that's what the rest of the world is doing. So at, at some point in time, if you assume that people are rational in their policy making, they would ask themselves a simple question. What does the rest of the world think about what we are doing? And if, the, if, the, if, if people in Washington, D.C. began to listen to the voices of the rest of the world, Brazil, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, France, you know, um, Indonesia, what would they say? Please calm down and also find ways and means of work, working with each other. Thank you. Yes, there in the back. Yes. Dave Epstein from the Cicillo Institute. You might recognize this is Harry Cicillo's uh, ethics for business. Um, so uh, you've left out Russia in describing Asia. And I, I also want to understand how um, sovereignty of land, like what's going on in Ukraine and the supporting of that. Tell me how, how uh, China is, is behaving in uh, supporting Russia in a, in a takeover of land um, at the same time as creating all, all kinds yeah. of uh, good trade and everything for everybody yeah. else. Well, the, 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 actually, the, the simplest way to answer your question uh, is that uh, China's position on Ukraine uh, is the same as the position of the world's largest democracy, which is India. Uh, so India, as you notice, uh, has not condemned the Russian invasion of Ukraine. India hasn't voted in favor of the resolution in the UN uh, condemning uh, Ukraine. And India, as you know, has not imposed sanctions uh, on Ukraine. In fact, in Indian purchases of Russian oil have gone up several fold since the Ukraine war began. So when everyone says it is China, <laughs> I think it's important to understand that 85% of the world's population has not imposed sanctions on Russia. And you know, I'm actually astonished that many Americans don't know this, you know, that the number of countries that have actually imposed sanctions on Russia is very few. It's true, 143 countries voted in favor of the resolution is true. But most of these 143 countries have not imposed sanctions on Russia. So the, and, 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 and the answer to your question is that most countries in the world are clearly are unhappy that Russia invaded Ukraine. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is illegal. It violates international law. Let's be very clear about that. But the story is more complicated, right? This Ukraine war didn't just start today. There were deeper antecedents. And if you, if you, if you, if you read the speeches of people like, uh, let's say, President Lula of Brazil, you'll say it's complicated, right? There was NATO expansion that uh, threatened uh, Russia. Russian insecurity became bigger. And so there, there, it's a much more complicated story. And China actually has been very restrained. China has not supported Russia in any way in terms of, you know, providing weapons or providing money even uh, to, to Russia. It's kept up its links with Russia, but then a lot of other countries uh, have done so too. And, and, and so, and, and, and also, uh, by the way, in my book, uh, Has China Won, I have a section on Russia and China in which I point out Russia and China are not natural allies. Indeed, Russia's long-term security nightmare is not European tanks invading Moscow, is the longest border with China. So the relationship is not the sort of simple black and white relation portrayal that you get in the American media. It's much more complicated. Yes, over here. Uh, Guan Shili, I'm from the law school here. Uh, so uh, with the China-US context right now, 
uh, being heated up. Um, so I'm worried that, you know, with the economics means like the chips, like the, you know, the trade tariffs, everything, when these means it got exhausted and still failed to contain China, US is gonna go with some hot war, uh, maybe Taiwan, you know, the issue there, uh, you see already started to see that, you know, uh, US is having lots of moves, uh, you know, uh, McCarthy's meeting with the Taiwan uh, president, um, seems to be like provoking China to take some, you know, more uh, aggressive stance. Um, so as a Chinese living in the US, having my career here, this is the worst nightmare that I can ever imagine. I don't want anything like that to happen. So um, and now the US, as you said, has this consensus between the parties um, that, you know, China is the only consensus. Um, it seems like the media is also banning the, the public of, you know, having some, uh, taking some more negative views of China. So my question is, will this heating context eventually go to a heated war? And if so, what's the exit? How can we prevent that? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, sure. <laughs> I mean, a great question. I mean, of course, you know that a war between two nuclear powers would be a disaster. You don't have a winner and a loser. You have a loser and a loser. I mean, even though China has far fewer nuclear weapons, uh, until a few years ago, only 300 nuclear weapons, United States is 6,000. Uh, clearly, both sides would lose, right? I mean, uh, can you imagine the United States with 50, 60 cities completely destroyed, right? Boston reduced to rubble. You can imagine that. Uh, that's what will happen in, in a nuclear war between the U.S. and China. So I think both sides know that they have to avoid a nuclear war. But at the same time, you can have an accidental war. And the, the accidental war will start over Taiwan. And in fact, the, 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 the tragedy about Taiwan is that it's very easy to keep the peace in Taiwan. Very easy. Don't change anything. <laughs> U.S. and China have a set of agreed formulas. U.S. says it believes in a one-China policy. The U.S. says that it doesn't support the independence, right? Fine. Stick to that formula. Then there'll be no war. But if, if unfortunately, uh, uh, sadly, Bill, a Republican called Mike Pompeo wins the presidency of the United States in 2024, Mike Pompeo says he will recognize Taiwan as an independent country. Now, if he does that, there'll be war. China will invade Taiwan. I mean, that's very clear. In fact, that's the reason why I, I created an edX course, e, EDX course on US-China relations, because I want Americans to understand that the Chinese, for the Chinese, they suffered a century of humiliation from 1842 to 1949. You must understand the century of humiliation if you want to understand the Chinese psyche. And this century of humiliation, all the traces have gone except one, Taiwan. And Taiwan was first separated from China in 1895 when China lost the Sino-Japanese War. So Taiwan has got tremendous amount of emotional and political uh, power in the Chinese mind. And no Chinese leader can give up Taiwan. No Chinese leader can give up Taiwan. He'll be killed, right? So Taiwan is a red line in which you mustn't cross. And we have a formula, the formula that was worked out for the last 50 years. Why has there been peace between US and China for 50 years? Because they have an agreed formula on Taiwan. But of course, when you start to change it, when Nancy Pelosi uh, went to visit Taiwan, and Tom Friedman described it as a dangerous, irresponsible, reckless act. Tom Friedman was right. When you try to change the boundaries on Taiwan, you can trigger a war. So whatever you do, don't change anything on Taiwan, then I guarantee you there's no war. Very good. Yes, this side has been rather silent. Here, please. Ah, hi, Ashu. <laughs> 
Um, in the fall <coughs> of uh, in fact, general international security, generals in the field of security, uh. published an article by Meg Meyer, teaching at Harvard Business School. Yeah. Mm. National security, a leading journal of security, um, in the fall, published an article by Meg Ritmeyer, teaching at Harvard Business School, Ellie Sai, teaching at Hong Kong University of Science, and another colleague <coughs> teaching at University of Maryland. These are three established China scholars. The title, they both were, uh, all three work on, on the on the political economy of China, the relation politics and economy. Mm. The title of the article was a surprise for many for party state capitalism in China, not state capitalism, in China. party state capitalism. Mm. Um, do I have to miss? Am I right? Yes, yes, please. Now, the reason this is important is that in your analysis, Kishore, the internal, internal political arrangements in China, I don't think feature enough. They argue that the earlier concept before rise of Xi Jinping was mm. China developing state capitalism. Mm. But now, since the rise of Xi Jinping, 1.88 million non-state firms, private firms, 73% had established party cells by 2018. Cells. Members of Communist Party have also been put on the board of almost every, and not almost every is important, not every, um, private company in China. Which therefore leads to very serious issues when you deal with China's so-called private economy. Because it becomes not just mm. state capitalism, it becomes party state capitalism. There are communist mm. party cells, and this is Megret Meyer's great mm. Harvard Business School data. 73% mm. of all private firms have communist party cells. Mm. And this was not true before the rise of the Private businessmen who were allowed to enter Communist Party in 2000 or 2001. Mm. Communist Party members were not sent to, mm. to the boards or party cells were not created. Which essentially means that the private economy of China mm. is no longer private. And it's worse than state capitalism because Communist Party is firmly entrenched in the private economy. Means who controls TikTok's data, mm. who controls the data of various technology firms, mm. and how much Chinese state would cut the uh, clip the wings of, mm. of the Hanjiao companies, Hanjiao companies, and mm. how much time the owner of the mm. company would spend in Japan and how much in China, all of that is a reflection that private capitalism in China. And Communist Party must dominate it, at least until so far as until until the time that Xi Jinping is there. That being so, mm. economic relationship that we're talking about as the foundation mm. of the rise and of the ongoing trade, mm. which would not be affected by mm. the ban on chips or the rising, not significantly say, affected mm. by a ban on chips. The rising um, mm. unity between the two parties on the hill mm. uh, against China. How would you assess the implication of all this mm. for the evolution of the economy and its trade? Okay, thank you very much. Please. <laughs> well, I mean, I I I would say, uh, Ashu, that I would take a bet with the three authors. <laughs> I will take a bet with the three authors, $1,000, put money on the table. If you say 
that the Chinese capitalist system is self-destructing, and they may be right in the analysis, China's economic growth should go down. I mean, if you put party cells into private companies that decide how much production that should be, and the owners have no way to decide how much to produce, and the party controls everything, capitalism dies in China, then China's economic growth rate should be minus or 1% or whatever it is, right? If these people are right. But if I'm right, China will grow 4 to 5% next 10 years. Because the party has always been part of China. Deng Xiaoping, why did the crackdown in Tiananmen happen? Because Deng Xiaoping saw it, the great economic reformer, as a major challenge to the party. He says, no, the party must remain in power. So the, the, the emphasis on keeping the party in power is a rock solid consensus. How they translate it on the ground, if the Communist Party is very heavy handed, as, as the three authors say it is going to be, then the Chinese growth story is over. I agree with them completely. But I believe that the Chinese have ways and means of managing these things because they don't want to kill the goose that lays the golden egg, right? And if the, if the golden eggs continue in the next 10 years, and that's my prediction, then I would say they should go back and understand China differently. Because the way China governs itself is a way that the Chinese have worked out. It won't, it won't work in India, obviously, right? But the, 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 the consensus within the Chinese body politic on how you run society, how you manage society, even uh, as you know, a Harvard Kennedy School study showed that support for the Chinese Communist Party among the population of China uh, has gone up from uh, 86% in 2003 to 93% in 2016. There's a Harvard Kennedy School study that shows this. So when you see the Communist Party as being something that is foreign, that is so ruthless and different from the rest of China. Actually, uh, the Chinese Communist Party at the end of the day has close to 100 million members out of 1.4 billion. And when I, when I had a research assistant in Columbia University, uh, a, a young lady from China, and she obviously one of the best and brightest to become I get a master's scholarship in Columbia University. I sat down one day, had coffee with her, and I said, uh, uh, how is your life? And she said, I had a good life. And you know, she says, when I graduated from high school, I was very depressed. So I said, why were you depressed? She said, I was the number two girl in this high school in the final exams. I said, hey, number two is very good. You know, I, I would accept number two, I'm happy. She said, no. I was very unhappy because only the number one is selected to join the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> so the, it's, it's, it is embedded in Chinese society in a way that you and I will not be comfortable with, but that clearly the Chinese people are comfortable with it. So when you see this uh, Communist Party of China as a great white shark that is going to come and eat up the Chinese economy, fine, let's see where that happens. But I put a thousand dollars on the table to say you won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, in the back. Yes, that lady over there. Hi, I'm Wen Shen Li. I'm a sophomore studying uh, political science at BU. And my question is simply that um, do you think a rise in Asia would lead to a multipolar world? Because it seems like now um, ASEAN country, they chose to deviate from China in security issue, especially China's uh, aggression in South China Sea and East China Sea mm. might sort of deter them um, from allying with China militarily. So they chose to choose the other side, um, choose in US instead to safeguard their security issue. But at the same time, the close connection between um, those country and China in economic ties might not be um, departed easily. So would you say that peop, um, country now might 
sort of form more strategic partnership instead of forming formal allies with each other, that would probably lead to a more multipolar world. Um, okay, yeah, that's my you. question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, please. Well, I mean, it is it is already a multipolar world, by the way. <laughs> I mean, that, that mean, by the, we had, as you know, a bipolar world in the Cold War. United States and Soviet Union were clearly above everybody else, no question. And then when the Cold War ended and uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, we had a unipolar world. Uh, and we can, of course, discuss when the unipolar world ended. But it is ending now. And now it is a multipolar world that is emerging. Uh, and the, the poles will be of different strength, by the way, very clearly. So I think United States is clearly the number one pole in the world. China is the number two pole in the world. And then maybe, you know, depending on, how do you say, in terms of economic weight, political weight, military weight, you know, the European Union, Russia, uh, Japan, and certainly India. Uh, I think India will emerge clearly as the number three pole in the world, clearly. And possibly uh, by 2050, maybe even the, the number one pole in the world. So the, the world is changing every, dramatically. And there are lots of other actors coming in. So uh, the, most of the world is adjusting to the fact that we will have a multipolar world. Uh, it, is, it is a reality. But your point about the, um, the South China Sea, uh, it's, uh, you know, you all worry about wars. Uh, let me assure you there'll be no war over South China Sea. Okay, there, there are differences in, uh, among the China and the four other claimant states. Okay, the China, the disputes in South, in South China Sea are between China and four claimant states, you know, Brunei, Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam. And the disputes will remain. There'll be tensions from time to time, but the discussions are continuing. And over time, there will be, the, the, the waters of South China Sea will remain calm. So there'll be no war there. Very good. Uh, one last question here. Yeah, thank you for the lecture. I'm Aman from uh, Mechanical Engineering as a slight global studies, that's why I'm here. Uh, my question to you is, uh, you mentioned that India will slowly grow up and maybe become number one pole by 2050. But I did my undergrad in India and I saw there are many like Indian uh, internal problems like religious intolerances and things happening that countries like India or China need to settle down. So how do you think like those countries will deal with them because India has a lot of diversity and there are different like multiple reasons even inside India. So what do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, uh, in, I mean, the real expert on India is sitting here, by the way, Ashutosh <laughs> Bhatni. <laughs> he should answer the question. Uh, but I, I just want to say that I'm broadly speaking very bullish on India. And you know, the, the, the reason why I use the phrase a thousand flowers huh, is that India and China are so different from each other, okay? So the Chinese model of success works for Chinese society. The Chinese model of success will not work for Indian society, right? It's much more, Indians, as you know, are much more open and argumentative. And, uh, Amatya Sen wrote a book called The Argumentative Indian. Uh, so in the Indian political system, Indian culture will be very different, but in their different ways, both will be success, very, very successful. In fact, over the next 10 years, and there's no question the Indian economy will grow faster than the Chinese economy, partly because also the Chinese economy is much bigger. Chinese economy is now, uh, what? Somewhere between trillion. five and six times as big. Yeah, and China, India is still just about three, am I correct? So there's a big gap. The Indian Chinese economy is six times bigger. So of course it's gonna grow slowly, more slowly, but India will grow much uh, faster. And, uh, and, but it would be, be very different. So for example, you know, uh, China succeeded by becoming the factory of the world. India is going to try and become the factory of the world, but it may not be as successful. But in other areas like services, India does brilliantly, uh, better than any other country. So they, they, they'll succeed uh, in, 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 in different ways. And, and, and India, I think, is actually on the verge of the kind of explosive growth that China went through uh, after it joined the WTO in 2001. Yes, when I was in India, there was a phrase that was used by the Economic Times. It was called the global Indian takeover. 
which was a bit over the top, <laughs> but signaled a certain attitude and to the back. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for your wonderful speech. Uh, I am a graduate student from the uh, School of Theology. Um, yeah, I'm also Chinese. Um, I find, yeah, I really appreciate uh, many of your comments on my country, and I feel that uh, you you know China much 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 better than many scholars, foreigners um, I know in in the U.S. and in China. Um, I find there is a problem in um, the Western uh, ac academic uh, circle um, that do we, uh, does the research uh, about China. Most uh, prerequisite assumptions are based on the Western uh, framework. It, I find that many Western scholars like to analyze China from the Western perspectives. I find that, um, you know, the Chinese society is totally different from, from the Western, any Western systems. As I study theology, I, I find that uh, many issues, many, you know, points and analysis uh, should be um, drawn on the very fundamental um, cultural and uh, social analysis. Okay, what is the question? Yeah, the question is that do you think that uh, there should be a, a revolution in the uh, Chinese studies? In the, I, I would say that uh, a new paradigm, a new framework needed to be created to to do the research on China. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I must say you've asked a very, very big question. And the, 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 you're, you're absolutely right about your core point uh, that the West doesn't understand China. That's very, very clear. And I see my role, you know, I'm not Chinese, as you know. <laughs> By the way, I don't read Chinese, I don't speak Chinese. And actually, I don't claim to be an expert on China, okay? But I've been obviously watching China for 50 years, right? And I've gone to China a few dozen times. And I also live in a Chinese majority society, which is Singapore. And so I have a sense of how the Chinese mind works. And it's very clear to me that the Chinese mind works in a very different way from the Western mind. Now, of course, the, when the Chinese, like the Japanese, by the way, huh, when they come to America, they pretend that they agree with everything. <laughs> and that's part of the diffidence that I spoke about. But in their heart of us, they don't agree. And so, for example, and one, 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 of the, one of the amazing realities about East Asia that people don't realize, actually, is that Japan is an ally of the West. China is seen now as a threat to the West, an adversary of the West. But culturally, China is closer to the West than Japan is, you know. Japan, the Japanese mindset is even more closed, and I can know that, uh, and even more different. 